Okay, cool. If you start to not be able to hear me, tell me, and I'll turn the mic up. Hang on. I can't figure out how to shut it off, so we'll see what critter could crawl under the table. You guys can hear it as background noise. So I'm going to share with you guys some, some experiences I've had within social media, how I got started, some of the lessons I've learned, some of the fun we've had working with some really interesting industries. It's really neat to see some faces that I know in here. Dan, Ben, uh, Caitlin, and all kinds of other cool people. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm excited to be here. I want to get started with sliding across this floor and breaking my ankle and then moving on to the first slide. And then we're going to talk about how I got started with social media. And I share about this not because you're so interested in me, but because I think it's interesting to see how careers end up where they are. And I think especially with social media, it's kind of like this Pandora's box, right? Where people are always like, hey, how did you end up in that? That's not really like being a dentist or that's not really like being a salesman or something like that. And so back in 2005, I had accepted a job working for a uniform company named Cintas. And my brother was a big wig there, and he said, you need to come down south, and you should come with me and sell uniforms to tobacco farmers. And so I thought it was a great idea. I was tired of the cold weather in Maine, and off to South Carolina I flew, and promptly started getting trained on how to sell Carhartt uniforms to tobacco farmers in 115 degree heat. Have any of you in here ever worn Carhartt clothing? Triple stitch, canvas, pants, thick, like exactly what you want to be wearing in tobacco fields, right? And so I accepted the job and I got down there. My wife and I were pretty excited to be someplace warm where the sun was all the time. You got to walk around in all the seasons. And it was great, but the problem was I sucked at sales. And so within about three or four months, I began to realize this might not be a great fit for me. Uh, I'm not really a great salesman. I don't really like what I'm doing. And about a couple months after that, they realized that I sucked at sales and let me go. And so I found myself without a job in a city in a state where I knew nobody because we had just moved down there and in an economy that was really, really bad. And this was right around 2005, and we all remember all the crap that happened leading up to that. And so I knew I'm not going to be able to find a job down here. I don't know anybody. And it was so obvious that I was a Yankee when I would pull onto people's properties that they would literally say, here comes that Yankee. I can see him coming. And I'd pull onto their tobacco farm, and they, they had one strike against me right away. So I called my father, who was back up here in Maine, and I said, you know, Dad, I, I just lost my job. I've been let go. I don't know what I'm going to do next. I'm going to have to go ahead and, and create a job because this economy down here is terrible. Nobody knows me. Nobody trusts me. I don't even have any real friends down here. I've only been down here a few months. And he goes, well, then what the heck are you going to be? And I said, I don't know, but I want to try to find a way to use my skills that I've learned through all these networking things that I've been involved with and apply them online. And he's like, okay, well, that doesn't sound like it's possible, but, but okay, have fun with that. Well, it was shortly a few weeks prior to that that Facebook came up with business pages. And all of a sudden, people started talking about how they could go online and they could leave reviews for companies, or they could go and back then like a company or be a fan of a company. And I started to say, well, this, this seems pretty neat. This seems like a lot of the industries I've been involved with in the past. I built it. I had a long and illustrious Amway career. I'm very proud of that. But I was involved with Amway from 16 to 30 years old, and I've done all kinds of things for them. And social media struck me as kind of like an Amway online type of deal, right? It's just relationship marketing, getting to know people, and leading them in, into making the decisions you want them to. So I decided that I was going to be a social media expert. And that is what I labeled myself. I changed my LinkedIn title to David Pride, social media expert. And how do you get business? You start making phone calls. And so I quickly decided, okay, I need to find companies that are active on social media. Well, in 2005, that was really easy to do. In fact, today, it's still really easy to do. And so I started making phone calls, and I knew I wanted to come back up here to Maine. My mother was sick. We wanted to help me take care of her. I started making phone calls. And as I'm dialing, I start looking for companies that seem like they might be creative. And I looked into this company that was out in Yarmouth, Maine at the time, named Chipco International. Have you ever heard of them before? They were the world's second largest poker chip company. And so they made poker chips for casinos all over the world. Uh, they made poker chips for private collectors. And they just had all kinds of neat things going on. And I thought to myself, boy, this makes a ton of sense that this poker chip company should be doing something more with social media. So I called them up. I was able to get the CEO on the phone, Mr. Kendall. And I said, Mr. Kendall, you know, I'm David Pride, and I'm a social media expert. And back then he said, well, OK, what does that mean? And I said, well, you know, like Facebook and Twitter, I'm an expert at all that. Now, keep in mind, I hadn't used any of this for business at all up until this point. And he said, OK, well, tell me more. And I said, well, as you know, the World Poker Tour right now is really, really popular. And here's the thing. There's people on Twitter and Facebook talking about your poker chips right now, and you're not talking back. Don't you think it makes sense to get your relationship better and we can potentially grow this business with the help of social media? And he stopped for a second, and he said, yeah, I think that might make sense. And he said, well, David, where are you located? 
And I was sitting in my apartment in Somerville, South Carolina, a 22 hour drive away from Yarmouth, Maine. But I said, oh, I'm in Wyndham. And he said, okay, great. He said, well, when would you like to come and meet with me? And this was on a Tuesday. And I said, I don't know, when do you think you can see me? And he said, how about you come by Thursday afternoon? I said, that sounds perfect. And so I hung up the phone, began packing. My wife gets home from work. And she says, what the heck are you doing? All your crap is up. And I said, oh, Aaron, I'm going up back up to Maine. I'm going to pitch a client. I'm going to land it. And we're moving back to Maine. And we're starting a social media agency. And she says, you don't know anything about social media. And I go, you know what? You're right. But neither does anybody else. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to pitch this client. We're going to win it. So I start packing my bag, start getting ready to head back up to Maine. And that was when I discovered a podcast that started educating me all about social media. And back in the day, Internet Business Mastery was a podcast that came up, I think, weekly. And back then, they were talking all about social media and the changes. And so for the next 20 hours as I drove back to Maine, I listened to podcasts all about social media and how to generate revenue with it and how to track it, how to do all these cool things because of all the stuff that's happening with social media. Got up to Maine, got to my parents' house, created a PowerPoint, went over, met with John the next day, pitched him, won the client, and there began my illustrious career in social media. From there, things began to get really interesting, though, because it was fascinating to me that people were online all the time talking about the things they love, the things they hate, the things that they're for, the things that they're against. And when it came to poker chips, there were actually a huge amount of people talking about his chips. Now the interesting thing, and the first lesson I learned, and one that I think everybody should remember, is that lots of times your community, your online community, or your social media community may not be where you think they should be. Right, because I thought that all these people should be on Facebook because back then even Facebook was the thing that everybody talked about. Well, after further research, I began talking with the actual customers and surveying them and finding out where are you guys interacting? What are you talking about? It turned out there was this little tiny forum called chiptalk.net. Chiptalk.net is like the old internet. Uh, if you remember like the forums we used to roll around on, right? And we did send little cute messages. Well, chiptalk.net is just for poker chip collectors. And it was fascinating. I began to find out that, holy cow, there's a ton of buzz happening about these chips over on these other social networks where they may not even be considered social networks. They're so much different. <laughs> well, from there, it led us into beginning to monitor the name on Twitter. And we started catching up with people talking about the chips, the security features. Uh, Chipco International really had developed in amazing features on their chips that almost fought against fraud on its own. And we began to find out that there were certain people talking about our chips who had huge communities. Right? Nowadays, we call them influencers. Back then, we called them, holy crap, how do we get them to talk about our chips? And so with the influence, we begin to share with it and talk with them. And one of the great things we're able to do is we begin to answer questions with people, and we'd hold contests saying, you know what? If you can win this contest, we'll give you an opportunity to call in, and you can ask our CEO anything. Now, the average company probably can't just go ahead and do that, but it was really neat because the collectors who were so excited about the chips, when they had an opportunity to talk with the guy who invented the chips and continued changing them, they were really fired up about it. And it began to generate some buzz. Right? We weren't advertising the chips on Facebook or Twitter because a lot of the people buying the chips were huge casinos or just private collectors, but the buzz we were generating offline began to have things moving within the store. We also quickly realized that that online relationship we had with social media and with them on Facebook or Twitter, or if we found them in these forums, that was great, but we didn't own it. And so very quickly, we began to realize we need to get these conversations and somehow get these people onto our email list. And I will tell you, I don't know how many times I've had customers ask me, now that Facebook's around or now that social media's here, can't I just cancel my website? I don't even need it anymore, right? You know, and people ask me this all the time. And I will tell you for the eight millionth time that the only thing you own on the internet is your website and your email list. Everything else can be gone in a heartbeat at the whim of somebody who controls that social network. So the more you can do to capture your customers or prospects information and get them into a database to have a long-term relationship, the better. And the same rang true with us, the poker chips. What I quickly found was that social media is the, was the great equalizer, right? It gave the small business, the small company, the little guy over here, this little poker chip company that a lot of people didn't know about or weren't even talking about, and all of a sudden had a voice like everybody else, right? Gives the mom and pop shop, if they're creative enough and doing enough things, the opportunity to operate like a great big business and reach the same amount of people. So as I was working with Chipco International, I came across this book called The Instigators. If any of you like to geek out on social media information, check out this book, The Instigators. And it walks you all through the Arab Spring movement. And I was reading this book, and it was, it was really fascinating. And at the time, I was living in Westbrook, Maine. And I finished up the book, and, and one of the things that stuck out is I kept mentioning these private Facebook groups, where these groups of people were meeting online and organizing. 
right? And then from the organizing, it turned into larger groups, and from larger groups, it turned into larger movements. And next thing you know, there were thousands of young people in person talking about the changes that they want to see happen in Egypt. And throughout the book, they actually mentioned the Facebook group names. And so I thought to myself, well, why on earth can I join this Facebook group? I want to hear what's going on. And so I, I, I searched down the group. I found the group, requested access. And as I'm sitting there, all of a sudden, I get a message from the leader of this movement. And he said, David, I just saw your request to join our private group. I'm very curious why you would want to be a part of our Facebook group. And I said, well, Walid, I'm really fascinated by what you're doing. I just read a book about you, and I'd love to just keep in touch with you. And it was fascinating because from there, for the next two or three years, I began to communicate with some of the leaders of the movement within the Arab Spring, and they would share with me information of things that were going to happen that I'd hear about on the news that night. And I'll never forget when the major rally happened to Tahir Square, and I get a message on Facebook, and it's, Walid, letting me know about wait till you see what we're going to do. Wait till you see this. And the next day, what's on the news? But hundreds of thousands of young people changing the government for the better. And again, I'm re reminded, social media being the great equalizer, right? Social media gives everybody a voice. Social media gives everybody a chance to do something that they want to do to reach the, the maximum amount of people that they possibly can. And from there, this, this great friendship began between myself and some of the leaders of the movement and my fascination with the ability of people to change the world with their own voice. And then, while sitting at home in Westbrook in my pajamas, one evening, uh, the same gentleman who was involved in the Arab Spring happened to post a photo of him having dinner with Steve Wozniak. And I was sitting there and I commented on his Facebook page and I said, wow, are you sitting with Steve Wozniak? Apple Computers was just named one of the richest companies in the world. And he wrote back and he said, Steve says he's not that rich. And so I wrote back and I said, hold on, are you sitting with Woz like right now? And he said, David, grab your iPad and call me. And so I ran downstairs, I put on my little sweater, as you can see there, my hair was significantly shorter back then, and I put on my sweater, sat on my couch, and I called Walid, and Walid answered on his end, on his iPad, and said, David, I want you to meet my friend Steve Wozniak. And for about 35 seconds, I sat in my living room in Westbrook, Maine, in my pajamas, and talked with Steve Wozniak about Maine, about what he was doing in Amsterdam for the Young Youth Leaders Conference, and we shared a few other things, and then it was gone. And again, I held up my iPad and said, holy cow. You know, six months ago, I was standing out in the tobacco field trying to convince some guy that he needed to buy 600 pairs of pants for his illegal workers. And now, here I am chatting with Steve Wozniak, all because of this technology, all because of these changes that are happening. So my first two years in social media taught me that everyone has a big voice. You'll see, you know, that it says, thank Pepto. Well, I used to really enjoy interacting. One of, the, one of my favorite companies on social media is Pepto, is Pepto Bismol. As a man of larger carriage, I do tend to take their product quite often. And uh, when I was sitting on Facebook and I, I commented on something they shared, and they wrote to me and they said, hey, David, do you mind if you send us, send us your name and address? We'd like to give you a little thank you for interacting with us so much. And this was my first interaction with a company, a corporation, this is years ago, taking the conversation from being an online conversation where I get to talk to you and you might talk back, but it goes no further, to all of a sudden they want my address. I said, sure. Well, about a week later, I got a personalized package from Pepto-Bismol, and everything was pink. Now, what was cool about it was it was all bought in Maine. And so I got a pink L.L. Bean tote bag with a pink beach towel with my name engraved on it with a pink water bottle with a gigantic thing, a pink Pepto, and then a handwritten note in pink highlighter saying, David, thank you for interacting with us so much on social media. We hope you'll share these gifts with your friends. And what was the first thing I did? Took a picture of it, posted it on Facebook, told all my friends, went and wrote a blog about it, which we then ended up talking about the Social Media Breakfast of May, which they then published, and have since talked about that story for the last nine years telling people about how cool Pepto-Bismol was when they took that conversation offline. See, the key is you just have to be a little bit more creative, a little bit faster thinking, and allow yourself to think outside the box. I think so often, we get so stuck on what's the exact strategy here. You know, like, this is our strategy, this is our argument, we can't veer away from it. If we get too creative, it might, it might go wrong. If we do something like this, we can't get, and with social media, you can stay on the strategy, but there still may be opportunities for you to do something different, something that wasn't in the plan, something that takes it out of the box and allows you to get just a bit more creative. So moving forward to some of the various restricted clients that I've worked with. So shortly after getting started with Chipco International, uh, I wound up uh, getting introduced to a man who had a vitamin company. The vitamin company specialized in the television products that you see. 
after 11 o'clock at night, and they're usually involved in helping people feel better, stronger, thicker, firmer, longer lasting, or something along those lines that's going to help people move forward in their love life. And it was quite interesting because naturally everybody thought that this would be a great fit for social media. Right, boy, we know who we want to target, we know the age demographic we're going into, we know who we want to reach, so let's just go ahead and run Facebook ads. But what was the first thing that began happening? Facebook began rejecting our ads, right? They quickly began saying, you can't claim that, you can't say that, you can't show those pictures. And we began to have to figure out how do we navigate around this? What on earth can we possibly do to operate within the rules of Facebook? This being years ago, the rules weren't even published. What's great now is if you don't know, all the Facebook rules for advertising are very easily spelled out now just by visiting the Facebook help section. You can actually go there and see examples. Uh, if you use, do all of you have your Facebook business pages converted or using now through Business Manager? Awesome. If you aren't, do it, business.facebook.com. And what's great about Business Manager isn't just the ability to build your client's credit card so you're not trying to five random up on Facebook ads and then they screw you on the back end. What's better, what's even greater about Facebook Business Manager is that you can have live chat help with Facebook. And what's cool is if they have to go or if somebody's not available, you can actually leave your phone number and a rep from Facebook will call you and walk with you through your ad strategy to help you create an ad that, that serves the community that you're trying to reach best for free. So I highly recommend if you have a Facebook business page, if you're managing any type of ads for your, for your campaigns, make sure you're using Business Manager and make sure you check out that little help option that they're gonna serve you and give you an opportunity for. Actual Facebook rules, actual examples, uh, we found that with, with products, especially vitamins, health products, we have a series of, of various vitamins and, and health and weight loss products that we work with and aloe products. We have found that you can show the product, you can show the end result, but you can't show the A and then the B, right? You can't show the me before this product and then the me after, because that qualifies as a claim. I can say that aloe will make your belly feel good, but I can't say that aloe will help indigestion. I can say that aloe makes an upset but upset belly feel happy, but I can't say that aloe cures your antacid. And so it's just a matter of, of working through it. What I've also found is changing up ads. If an ad is canceled, or if an ad isn't allowed, or if an ad is rejected, sometimes all you need to do is write back to them and ask why. And they will tell you. You now have an option to say, if, when an ad is rejected, you can, uh, you can request to find out why, and they will tell you why. I would also recommend checking out johnloomer.com. Do all of you follow his blog or read his stuff? Hopefully, J-O-N-L-O-O-M-E-R, johnloomer.com. He has a great blog on his site called 66 Reasons Your Facebook Ad Was Rejected. And it is an awesome blog. I won't go through all 66, but I will tell you that John also publishes a great free newsletter. He also has a ton of free eBooks, and he is an absolute Facebook advertising expert that I highly recommend if you're, if you're doing a lot of advertising that you check out. We also found that having some humor could lead to organic actions that we were looking for. Some of our clients uh, who were trying to do advertising wound up getting blacklisted, right? They submitted too many ads and rejected too often, and then what happens is every time they submit an ad, it doesn't matter what it's for, it's just not approved. And there wasn't, still isn't a whole lot we can do to get past that. But we have found having humor around the product uh, would lead to a shareable action, inviting people to share it, uh, comment on it. Also, contests and giveaways. I'm going to talk about one in just a second. But I am absolutely amazed by what people will do for a $20 Amazon gift card or a $15 Starbucks card. It will blow your mind uh, if, if you try a simple contest with some sort of giveaway attached. People are willing to give up their email addresses if you're willing to give something in return. And all of this helps, right? Because if you can get enough people interacting organically with your contests, Right? Well, we all know what Facebook ads are in, and so the more people interact with your page, the more people that see your page, the more often it is likely to show up in their newsfeed again. So you can move beyond that 2-3% organic reach that most of us are battling. The other one is we want to drive traffic to blogs that live on the site. Right? We want to drive traffic to blogs, and, and we want to drive traffic to content on your site that you own. Right, because from there we can go ahead and capture customer information. Because you never know if you're within one of those uh, testy subject matter areas, it's very easy for Facebook or someone else just to shut you down. And I'll talk about some some people in just a minute that that did in fact happen to. 
So what are some of the tools that I use for some of these clients? Have any of you have used Woobox before? It's a really easy, really inexpensive tool. What I love about Woobox is A, it's simple. I am not the brightest light bulb on the Christmas tree, and I don't have a ton of time trying to figure out how to use fancy softwares and things like that. What's great about Woobox is it's simple. Uh, also, there's a free option, so you really can't beat free. And then it goes up based on what you're gonna be using. If you have a page that has like 100,000 likes, it's gonna be a little bit more expensive. But if you're an average page, say with you know, three, four, 5,000 likes, it's not going to be that expensive. I think it probably, somewhere around $99 a month. And so, but what's great about Woobox is you can simply drag and drop contest pictures of what you want people to do. They'll have a setup, so there's an entry page, and then there's the page that tells them all about the contest where they put in all their information, and then a thank you page where they can share it, and if they do, they get more entries into the contest. But Woobox is a great software that's super simple to use if you're looking for something to get organic traction with people and get people interacting with your page. Another favorite of mine is Interact. And you can check it out at tryinteract.com. And no, I'm not a paid endorser for any of these people, just so you know. Um, but try and interact is cool because if you've seen those viral quizzes, like what dog would you be or what marinara sauce is your personality, those things. Well, interact makes creating those simple. And what's also great is at the end of the contest you create, they allow you to have a call to action where it can be enter your email address, download our app, visit our website, share it with a friend, whatever you want it to be. And so we have an app client in Washington, D.C. who makes an app, and with this many people in the room, somebody has another phone, white noise. Who falls asleep with the white, thank you. I knew it. Um, so, so we created, with, with white noise, um, we, we wanted to find a way to get more people to download it, the updated version of the app. But we didn't want to drop a ton of money into advertising, but we want to say, okay, what can we do with some sort of contest that might be cute? And so we came up with the idea of what animal represents your sleep pattern. And so we had all these different questions people would go through, there's about five of them. And then at the end, it's still, you know, you sleep like a gazelle or something cute. They can share with their friends, they get more entries. Well, it resulted in a couple hundred downloads of the app, tons of interaction across Facebook, and we spent about 50 bucks. So I encourage you to check out Interact. It's an inexpensive way to create those cute viral quizzes. There's all kinds of other softwares out there. This is the one that I've used, and, and like I said, key being, it's not too terribly expensive. So the next topic is social media firearms. One of my clients is Wyndham Weaponry. They're Wyndham made. They are manufacturers of uh, rifles and various firearms for military, police, uh, and some personal hunting use, those type of things. And what's interesting about firearms is much like tobacco in most of the cannabis industry, firearms can't advertise online at all unless it's within a firearms website. So you can't run Google ads for Wyndham Weaponry. You can't run uh, Facebook ads, Twitter ads, Pinterest ads, Instagram ads, any of them. So any growth they have has to be organic. Now luckily, lots of their fans are pretty passionate, and lots of people who don't like them are pretty passionate, so it's pretty easy to get organic results as long as you're posting consistently. But there are some tri tics, tri tricks there we go, that we have found that have treated us really, really well. The first being that, that with, with Wyndham Weaponry, I don't know if any of you know the Wyndham Weaponry story, but it's fascinating. And with Wyndham Weaponry, one of the things they pride themselves is their family environment. It's a family-owned company. It's been around for, for a few years, and the company prior to that had been around for a very long time. And so they wanted their social media to be an extension of their personality. And so if you were to go on their Facebook page, you're not going to see a ton of professionally produced photos or amazingly, you know, clearly salesy sales photos. You're going to see a whole lot of photos from around the manufacturing warehouse, around from production, around from customer service, because they want the people to feel really connected to the company and to the people, the workers behind the products that they were producing. And what's been fascinating with, with Wyndham is that with constant keyword monitoring, We've been spying conversations happening around the world about their products. And one of my favorite stories that happened with Wyndham is we monitor uh, the word Wyndham Weaponry all the time. And somebody on Twitter had tweeted out uh, asking a question about Wyndham Weaponry. And so we responded and I told the person about, about the, yes? Yeah. When you, what tool do you use to monitor keywords? Great question. I'm going to answer that in just two seconds. Um, but a great, good question, I won't forget. Um, and so somebody wrote to us and they asked us this, this question, they're, they had mentioned Wyndham Weaponry and this question about what rifle manufacturer might be the best for security. So we wrote back and we said, hey, we'd love to have a further conversation with you about this. Well, we got a direct message started with the guy and we went back and forth, back and forth. Turns out the young man was overseas, but he was from a very wealthy family that owned a very large oil field that was looking to outfit all of the security guards with firearms. And what was fascinating is this whole entire deal went from Twitter to a background check 
to then the ability to serve contract where they have to do all this stuff with the government to be able to purchase firearms from a manufacturer because you can't just walk in and buy one. And after all of that turned into a very large deal for Wyndham, all from just monitoring these key words. So the tool that we use most often in this message is brought to you today by Sprout Social, the sponsor of today's event. So I'm glad you asked. Uh, Sprout Social is a social media management software that I love. There's swag in the back. I'm a Sprout all-star. All that means is uh, there's, they chose a bunch of us to use their software to, to talk about them when we're out and about. Uh, and Sprout Social is cool for multiple reasons. One of which is their reporting. The other one is their monitoring ability. What I love about Sprout Social is I can put in keywords that I want to monitor, whether it be a client name or a specific phrase. One of our clients is in the pest control industry, so I can be monitoring back of mouse all the time. Or I can be monitoring termites from Florida termites. Um, any of these types of things all the time. And Sprout makes it very, very easy. The other nice thing with Sprout is they have packages that start at about 40 bucks. So you're not having, you know, it's not like a focus type of commitment, where they actually allow you to build month to month. It's not a ton of money, and they have great reporting. And so they allow you to schedule throughout almost all of the social networks, uh, and the reporting is by far superior compared to any other social media management software I've used in the past. Yes? Do you monitor anything on Google? Yep. So I, we also have, we have Google Keyword Alerts that we'll do. Um, we don't go too deep into the monitoring as far as exterior media, like radio or television. There's all kinds of great tools. Focus is one of them. Um, great tools for doing that. Uh, but with the more, all of our clients, we monitor keywords or key phrases, or key phrases that people may be saying in relation to that client. Um, you know, like one of my favorite stories is a phrase that I monitor all the time is looking for a professional speaker. About two years ago, uh, I had just left my job and a person had tweeted out looking for a professional speaker. And I was laying in bed doing my final Twitter scroll. I responded back and I said, geez, well, what are you looking for this professional speaker to talk about? And they said social media. And so I wrote back and I said, gee, hey, that happens to be what I talk about. Tell me more. So we went back and forth on Twitter. And then she said, right, we should probably move this to email. So the woman sends me an email and she said, David, uh, my name is Linda. Look, here's the deal. I'm holding an, 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 an event up here in a cattle at Nunavut. We're looking for somebody to come here and speak about social media. Our country just got high-speed internet. Would this be something you'd be interested in? And all because of monitoring social media and monitoring these key phrases. About three months later, I flew to a country I never even knew exist. Have any of you ever even heard of Nunavut before? That's about, about average, one out of 50. Um, it's an awesome place. It's incredible if you're looking for a place to travel. That's cool. That's the place to go. Um, also within Wyndham, what we have found is daily multiple questions coming in through Facebook, through Twitter, uh, Instagram. In fact, we now get more interaction, more customer service opportunities, and more business through Instagram than Facebook and Twitter combined, which is really interesting to us because we have uh, you know, almost 40,000 Facebook fans on Facebook and on Instagram. We might, I think they have about 7,000. But in, on any one day when we get one question coming in through Facebook, there's two to three coming in through Instagram, which is, has been really interesting. Uh, are any of you looking for a convenient way to schedule your Instagram posts? One that doesn't require second step verification? I'd encourage you to check out grum.co. G-R-U-M dot C-O. It's a free, it's, I'm sorry, it is not free. It is a service that's very inexpensive, it's about 13 bucks. Uh, for three profiles, and then it goes up from there, depending on the company you want. But what's cool about it is, unlike Hootsuite, unlike Sprout Social, sorry, Sarah, um, unlike all, all of the other social networks where you can schedule Instagram, but then you get that notification on your phone and say, okay, let it go live, Grum is the only service that I know of right now that allows seamless Instagram scheduling. So you can schedule out a week's worth of Instagram posts. They even give you the comment button below it. So if you want to, you know, however you prefer to do your hashtags, I do mine as the first comment below my photos. But if you do them within, however you want, it allows you to make it seamless. And there's no okaying it off your phone. So it's a great service that, uh, again, is being very inexpensive and does an awesome job moving things around. Uh, so as I said, online advertising is not available for firearms. We have found the best way for us to get interaction, especially within this industry, is by using user-generated content. And I think you're gonna find a common theme amongst any of these other industries I'll be talking about, is user-generated content, video, and live streaming are the, are the three things that, that I can kind of get. They all help organic growth. And in our case, in the case of, of Window, what's great about it is people want to share with us what they're, what they're working on. They may be customizing a product they purchased, they may have a question, but they're constantly looking to interact with us. So every week, we, we, we showcase 
photos that people have sent in, whether on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook, but we showcase them on Facebook so people come there to come and see the products that they had private message to us. It's been a great way to generate buzz, and more importantly, it's also been a great way to start conversations because people send those to us privately about their rifle or about whatever product it was that they purchased from us, and then a conversation begins, right? So the next thing you know is, well, how did you guys get started? Oh, I never knew your story. That's the Oh, actually, I had this issue come up. And then we can direct them over to this section on the site. Oh, you know, when are you coming out with this product? We can say, hey, I'll tell you what, this isn't a sales pitch for our newsletter, but sign up for a newsletter, you'll be the first one to know. And so we have found user-generated content to be such a great way to increase those relationships. And of course, resharing their photos on Instagram has been huge for us, right? We have a million and one photos of, of the different products that Wyndham services, right? But there's something about sharing somebody's photo who tagged us in the photo and resharing it, and all of a sudden all the buzz is happening, because right? they're all fired up that we did it. And they're a loyal customer, what, what are they doing? Two weeks later, they're taking another photo and tagging us. And we have seen, I attribute the Instagram growth from the 500 that it was last year to the 7,000 that it is this year that is completely organic. I attribute that almost entirely to resharing user-generated content. They are not the most beautiful photos, but they are the photos from the people that care the most about your product that want to tell all their friends. So I'd encourage you to recognize that and, and allow them to have a part of your plan. We've also had really great luck with partnerships who are also in a similar restricted industry. And so in this, whether it be in this industry or another industry, we have found that if you're all back in the same thing, heck, if you're not competitors, or even if you're doing business in different states, maybe there's something we can work on together, right? So we partner with individual dealers, or we partner with other people who create a similar product line and use each other's social networks to promote each other because we know we can't advertise. So, you know, we're both facing the same challenges, so why don't we work together? And that's as simple as sending out a message to the page and say, hey, here's the situation we're in. We'd love to grow. We see you have a vibrant community. Maybe we can do something together. Maybe we can cross promote. Maybe we can do a giveaway together. Maybe we can do a video together. Maybe we can come to your store and do a live video where we talk about our products and your products and the specials coming up. But always be looking for those opportunities for inspiration, for collaboration with other people in the industry, especially if you know that you're both facing the same challenges. And of course, we have found influencers to be insanely important. Influencers being people who have a large social media following that is usually pretty passionate about their product line or their service, right? And I think a key point here isn't the number of followers that person has, because you can go on Fiverr right now and have more Instagram followers than, I almost just said Kelly Clarkson, I have no idea why her name came into my head right there. But you can have a ton of Instagram followers uh, right away for five bucks, right? And so I would not um, be so worried about the amount of followers that your influencer has as much as the interaction that they're getting. Right, so if they're posting, are they getting comments and likes and people come down consistently? And I take it a step further when you're researching these influencers, I go ahead and click through on some of those comments and see who that person was. Because it is so easy to trick the system nowadays. It's worth doing a little bit of research before you offer an influencer deal. We have found, uh, for all of my clients, have yet to have to pay for an influencer uh, project. We've been able to give them product and then also cross promote, whether it be within the firearm industry or vitamin world or uh, exercise, we have found that influencers were anxious to work with us because we'd be promoting them, they'd be promoting us, and we give them a bunch of free stuff. So we didn't have to pay. In the case of this example, Marco Duval is a Brazilian uh, firearms expert. He came and, and had an idea of doing an expose dealing strictly with Wyndham products. We set up a deal with him where we would let him do that, we would cross promote. And what wound up happening is during the one week period where he was posting to our Facebook and posting about our products and posting reviews, we gained almost 2,000 organic likes and over 750 hits to the website. And there was a massive amount of sales attached to this. Now what also was fascinating is as we looked at the analytics, we could track it back to when he posted to when the traffic was coming to the site. And so I encourage you to look at those influencers. Now the next question you're going to have is, no, that's not the next question. The next question you're going to have is going to be about where can you find the influencers, right? What's the easiest way? You're going to hear me talk about in just a second a, a product called Intellifluence, and I'll share with you more about it in just a moment. And, and, and Intellifluence is cool because what's great is you can put in the product or service that you're involved with, and then they'll begin showing you influencers in that field. And so if you say, okay, well, I'm in the gardening industry, who else is out there that has a massive following for gardening? It's going to list off these people and different types of, of programs that are done. And I'll, I'll talk more about that in just a minute. 
Another industry we kind of happened to fall into was the legal cannabis industry, which is just opening up here in Maine. Uh, about a year and a half ago, we landed our first illegal cannabis client uh, in Maine, and it kind of just came about organically as we we're talking with people and training on social media. I write for Humble Farmer Magazine, which is a, a uh, pro-marijuana uh, New England-based magazine that helps educate people on on strains and health benefits and everything else. And so I write for them in the marketing section. From that came a client uh, within this industry. It's been a really fascinating industry to be involved with. Uh, I think the future for it's gonna be very, very uh, interesting. And I think it's, it's constantly changing. And again, it's another one of these restricted industries where you can't be advertising. But what is kind of interesting about this field is you can be advertising if you're an association or you're not promoting the direct sale. So I'd encourage you that even if your client, say your client isn't a caregiver, or they're not a dispensary, or maybe they're not some well-known butt tender, but maybe what they are it is they're an association that promotes the medical use of, you may be able to get away with advertising on Facebook. The National Cannabis Association advertises on Facebook quite frequently, because the rule is you can advertise on Facebook to promote the product, but not the sale or use of. So it's kind of weird, you have to navigate yourself and kind of choose your own adventure, but if you go ahead and look at some of the associations out there, especially involved in this industry, you'll see a lot of them beginning to be able to advertise on Facebook, and that's because they're promoting their event coming up where there won't be sale of this illegal product, because it is still a federally illegal product. We specialize mainly with small caregivers, 300 to 800,000, around a million, a million, but nothing much more. Uh, we have found the best way of establishing relationships with these people and people within the industry isn't so much uh, my traditional method of dial to my fingers, but it as much as meeting people in person. Now, there's a lot of skepticism when I sit down uh, and, and sit with a caregiver or sit with a dispensary owner and, and pitch them uh, to be involved with their business, with the industry that they're in. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of hooks that, that could be attached. This is the actual policy from Facebook as to what is allowed and what isn't allowed. Right? The, you cannot show a photo of somebody using it. You cannot show some, a photo of somebody's prescription medical marijuana. But if you were an association, you could talk about a seminar coming up of how to medicate with marijuana, but you could not promote the sale of that product there. And so get to know some of these rules. They're all listed right on Facebook. You really need, yes? If, could you promote? that you're having an event and who's going to be at your event? Yes. Like you purveyors? Yep. And so, um, a great example, again, um, the National Cannabis Association who does it, who's really on point. If you want to see a company within that industry that's doing a really great job, uh, and on a professional level, I would check, tell you to check out the National Cannabis Association Facebook and all their social media, along with Marijuana Business Daily. Both of them are doing a great job of elevating, no pun intended, all the different stigmas around the industry. Um, and so you can, you, can, you can talk about the event coming up, you can talk about the speaker, but you couldn't, if the speaker were to be selling something, or if there were sales at the event, from what I understand, you would not be able to advertise. So it gets kind of kind of wonky. I remember about the first time I was talking with Marijuana Business Magazine was about a year ago, and we were talking about an article that I was writing for them. And the guy said, "Look, we need you to understand that we're moving beyond the common stigmas of marijuana. And there's two groups of people: there's the boobs and bongs people, and then there's the people who are into this for the medicinal reasons, right? And so there's two very clear clear areas here of, of this field, especially. And I think as the stigma begins to change, there'll always be that first crowd. But I think as things begin to legitimize, and hopefully, if the federal regulations loosen up, there'll be a lot less fear about this, and I'll share about some of those fears and changes hopefully coming in just a moment. Uh, we have found most effective with all of our clients, we have a client up in Northern Maine that's quite a large um, operation. We have found in his case, most frequently, the most effective type of marketing is almost always testimonials, and real testimonials from people sharing their story. If we can get them to do it on video, even better, but the key is getting people to share their real stories and connecting it, in this case, to the strains that help. Right, because everybody thinks cannabis will get you high. Right, cannabis oil, this one pot, gonna be high. Well, there's also strains, and the strains can help people in certain specific ways. And we have found that sharing, again, that user-generated content has been a huge advantage for us with reaching the people we wanna reach. Shareable images, of course, right? I mean, there's so many interesting images that, that are involved in that industry. Uh, it's, it's been quite easy to come across content, but keep it so people are interested in sharing and, and reaching the maximum amount of influencers is key. I think the other interesting field here is these weed tubers. I mean, have you heard that term before? Weed tubers are the guys on YouTube who have massive 
followings amongst the cannabis community. If you're asking, I was like, oh yeah, well, people come and watch us on YouTube and we smoke together, right? Uh, there's Hash Sunday, uh, where people just get together, smoke hash on the internet, and then watch this guy leading like a hash church service, right? Talking about dabs and everything. And so that's, it's, it's wild, but these people have huge amounts of influence. On top of that, they're quitting their job to be weed tubers, right? And so these are the influencers of tomorrow. But what is also fascinating, and something to never forget about this market, is the realities of the industry. Because not too long ago, a bunch of these weed tubers all took a trip together to do a great pot video, and when they got off the plane, they all were arrested for promoting a federally illegal drug across state lines. So it's something to think about, because it is kind of scary. I just had a client get arrested with 17 pounds of medical cannabis in his office. That is a lot of jail time if that goes the way it likely will. And so keep those Things in your head, I would encourage you, if you're looking at, at the medical cannabis industry, get to know the good folks at Freddie Flaherty, just I think right across the street here. Uh, Steve Wilson specifically has given me a lot of counsel on this subject. They can help you with contracts that will protect you. I can tell you, you wanna make sure in your contract is that the client will pay the medical fee, uh, the uh, lawyer fees, right? If the, if the client, if you do get in trouble for helping market this, the biggest threat to the medical cannabis industry for marketers is just that, is helping market a federally illegal drug across state lines. And so it's kind of fun when you're sitting there and you're like involved in this cutting edge industry, but when you have a couple clients get arrested, it, it reminds you really quick what you're actually dealing with, right? And, and a great example is right here, Cannabis is, uh, Canada's Prince of Pot was just arrested two weeks ago. Owns 16 dispensaries up in Canada, travels all over the country talking pro pot and sharing with people all the different, all different ways that the industry is changing. Cannabis. The cannabis stock market in Canada is taking off, lots to do with him. Well, just the other week he stepped off the plane, him and his wife and the feds were there to arrest him. And so again, the, the realities of the, intro, of the industry are quite fascinating and, and constantly causing you to change perspective uh, and, and to change your approach with things, and especially within uh, things that are still illegal, even though in many minds they're kind of not. And so it's, it's confusing. But get to know and get to have a good lawyer. And, and if, you're, if you're involved with it, it's, it's really incredible where it potentially could take you. There are a lot of ways to advertise uh, medical cannabis not involving traditional social media. Probably all of you have heard of most of these. Leafly, I mean, actually, I, well, I guess I won't ask you to raise your hands. Um, Leafly, <laughs> I won't remember any of No, um, Leafly, uh, Weed Maps. Mass Ruth, Marijuana Business Magazine, High Times has been around a million years. Um, but I will tell you that a few of these are really gaining a lot of traction, right? Leafly's been around for quite a while. What's cool about Leafly is it's an app, it's also a website. There's a guide to strains there, depending on the person's condition, but also there's a guide to dispensaries. And so dispensers can advertise on there to reach a target market. It's not terribly expensive. Um, I've been talking with a lot of the folks down in Colorado who are advertising either on Weed Maps or Leafly. They're spending around 500 to 2,000 a month on advertising. They're seeing great results of people coming through the door and mentioning their ads that were either on Weed Maps or Leafly. Mass Roots is more of a social network focused, uh, cannabis enthusiast uh, social network. Again, another great place to advertise if you have a client in the arena. Marijuana Business Magazine is exactly that. If you think of main biz, this is the cannabis industry's version of it. You can sign up for their daily newsletter, and every single day you'll know about the latest changes in laws, you'll notice about what's happening in the, in the market. You'll also hear from actual marketers who are changing the industry and what they're doing. So I encourage you to check it out. They have a bunch of national conferences happening all the time. They also have a great bi-monthly magazine that they'll send to you for free. Just call them and ask for it. They'll send to you it. And then they also have all kinds of textbooks and, and uh, dispensary figures and trends and things that are coming up in the future. So check out Marijuana Business Magazine. And High Times, in my opinion, is more on the, on the, on the end of, of the first group, the more casual um, <coughs> consumption, the, the more the younger demographic. Uh, I talked with them not too long ago about their crowd, and they're still pretty much the same crowd it was when I was in middle school and high school, um, but, but it, it, interesting nonetheless. A key here and a key with any marketing is knowing your consumer though, right? And so if you are involved with the cannabis industry, and if you're trying to reach business professionals or lawyers and that type of thing, the odds of you finding them reading high times is probably pretty slim, but the odds of them maybe subscribing to Marijuana Business Daily might be a bit more acceptable. But knowing where your consumers will help you navigate some of these places where you could be advertising this type of restricted product. Tools to help you navigate. So another great tool for finding influencers. Have any of you used Group High before? No pun intended. 
So group, cool. Did you have a good experience? Awesome. So group high is a great way to find influencers. A bit, at least it used to be a bit more expensive than everybody else. But what's nice about it, they have all kinds of great reports. They also give you stats on people, how often the people are visiting their website, how influential they are. They'll, get, they'll connect you with influencers. You can print out massive Excel sheets of influencers based on the topic of the people you want to reach. They also give you a free trial. So if you just want to go and test it out for a week, you can do that. And you can do a lot of your research within that week if it's just for a single client. And so Group High is a, a great product. Ninja Outreach is kind of like the, uh, the Group High minus one. Ninja Outreach is kind of nice because A, it's inexpensive, and I'm a small company, I'm always looking for inexpensive ways to do things that big companies do for more money. And Ninja Outreach is neat, again, because it gives you a guide to influencers. So you can see the industry you want to reach. And what's cool about Ninja Outreach is Ninja Outreach actually has templates that people have used for that industry to successfully engage an influencer. And so if you are uh, involved in, in the, the restaurant industry and you're looking for a famous chef who can interact or, or share your stuff, Ninja Outreach is great because not only will they have the chef who has all the Instagram followers, who has all the topics you want covered, they'll also have a template saying, hey, other people have said something like this to engage this influencer and this was their results. So check it out and, and Telefluence is the same, same idea. There's a bunch of options out there, but I can't stress enough, if you don't have the option of using social media advertising, the next option is finding people that you can engage with who are interested in talking about your products or services and, and growing it organically. Other tools that I love and use, uh, social media management, we used to talk about Sprout Social. In my opinion, they have the, the best reporting available um, for social media management. Uh, you can also have teams within Sprout. You can do uh, go into Sprout and do all your monitoring, all your scheduling. Um, I also love another, another great thing about Sprout, the sponsor of today with all the swag and the t-shirts in the back, is that you can also run competitive reports which carries a lot of value. A lot of my clients want to know, how does my Instagram compare to my competitor's Instagram? How does my Twitter compare to growth trends and all of that? So it offers a lot of value. I use Get Pocket for sharing content quickly. Have you ever heard of Get Pocket before? You've all probably only heard of it if you've seen me speak before. Getpocket.com, check it out. What's great is that it's a browser extension. What's also great is that it's free. But if you're like me and you get 7,000 emails every single day, and you know some of those have information that you want to share later to your social media, but you don't have time to read it right now, with this, it drops a little browser extension, and you can click it, and it saves that article for you onto your pocket. So later on in the day, if you want to come back and you want to read all those articles you didn't have time to read right then, you can open up getpocket.com, you go in, and you can organize, organize by category, and there's all that content that you wanted to share that came in in the middle of your day that you just didn't have time to share. And if you don't have time to read that content, I highly recommend checking out a free app called Meet. Have you heard of Meet before? What's great about Meet is it's, a, it's an app for your phone, and if you're reading an article, and boy, you know, I really want to read this, but these McKinsey articles are like four million words long, I'm not gonna have time to read this whole thing right now. With Meet, you push a single button and upload it to me. Later on in the day, you can just open up the app, push play, and it reads the article to you. So the way I use that is I get all kinds of industry, you know, emails and all kinds of uh, different articles that I'm just not going to take time to read while I'm having my coffee. Well, I can save it and later on when I'm driving home, plug my phone into my car, open up Meet, push play, and it just reads the articles one by one. And it works out really great because you can still consume that content, but you don't have to try to find the time to read it all. <laughs> My favorite tool for, for manipulating those user-generated images that, that get submitted that half the time are crooked or, or the photos have cut off or really don't look great is Canva. I assume probably some of you are using Canva right now or have. Uh, Canva for me is like Photoshop for dummies. Photoshop, it was so hard for me to figure out. I was so thankful when Canva came around. Canva is a free service that allows you to manipulate images, uh, add features, add great framing, create cool looking collages, uh, add text overlay. They also have templates already set up based on the social media where you're going to share this image to. So if you know this image is going to Instagram, then if you go to canva.com and you just click Instagram, it's going to open up a blank template for you that's already sized perfectly to display on Instagram. Same thing with Facebook ads, blog images, Facebook landscape images, profile photos, all of it. Canva is the key. And what's also nice is they have thousands and thousands of stock photos. And so if you need an image that you actually own the rights to, Canva's great because all of them are only 99 cents. And so you can go on, they have a ton of free ones, but if you need something more customized, you can go on to Canva and purchase one for just 99 cents and have the information that you wanted. 
And finally, our latest project that we've been working with within the restricted world is about, about a month ago, somebody, my Facebook ad rep, uh, had told me that ads were performing really well in, in Egypt and that I should do a test ad just to see what happened, to see what the cost per click was. And we were kind of joking about it and I decided that I would. Well, through that process, I ended up uh, meeting a young man uh, online who, who happened to see my ad and click through. Uh, the ad was also running on Instagram. And, and about, about a month ago, I got a message from a young man in Iran and he said, David, I just read an article about you that you had written uh, about some of the work that you did in Egypt. And a group of my friends and myself are looking to do something very, very similar here in Iran. And for a second, I'm like, what? <laughs> what is it? Like, I thought it was my older brother, like, jacking with me, because that's something he would totally do. And I'm like, oh, and so I wrote back and I asked him a few more questions. And then naturally, I'm extremely skeptical because, you know, there's a lot of things going on in the world and you never just know who to trust. Well, it turns out this was totally legit. And over the course of the next few weeks, I began to figure out that there's a large amount of young people in Iran right now that don't want Iran to stay the way that it is. And they're looking for ways to organize. And well, here's the thing. They saw with Egypt how much, could be, how much could happen with just some Facebook and Twitter. Well, Iran saw that too and quickly blocked those two social networks. And so what's been fascinating is as we've been talking and going back and forth, we've been hearing about the things that are going on in Iran. And, and he's been sharing with me photos and videos of protests happening where people are, are, are getting beaten just for taking a stance against some of the things that are happening. And they're searching for a way to organize how to get moving, what are the things we can do. And so we've been communicating, we've been finding ways to talk through encryption, uh, through methods where he won't get in trouble or killed or arrested for communicating with me. And it continues to blow my mind, though, about how small the world is with social media. He actually wrote us, uh, something for me that I told him I'd put up here uh, today. From old man, which, which is not his, his real name. Um, we don't share his photo just for his own safety, but it's about his vision for Iran and where things are headed and what he wants to see happening. And it's fascinating the amount of young people around the world that are looking at social media and realizing I could change something, I could do something better, I just need the voice. And thanks to social media, and thanks to things changing so quickly, they suddenly have a voice. And now if they can just stay out of danger when they're using that voice. Then, then things just might work out for them. And if you want to read this later, you can. I'm happy to share it with you. I realize it's a, it's a little lengthy. So what are we using to talk so that Omen doesn't end up uh, in, in a lot of trouble? We use a lot of encryption tools. So one thing that's nice is, is WhatsApp has end-to-end -end encryption. And if you're communicating with a country that uh, is known for having those types of issues, it's automatically end-to-end -end encrypted anyhow. And so we're fairly safe communicating through there. We've also found Signal. Have you ever heard of Signal before? It's what Edward Snowden recommends, right? Because it's completely encrypted. It's even better than WhatsApp. And it's a great way to communicate. Now, it's the same thing. What's fascinating about this is this also works really well within some of those industries where the clients don't want to answer specific questions about what they're involved with. So if you have a client within the cannabis industry, and if you email him to ask him a specific question about this product at this price, that is soliciting the sale of a federally illegal product. You could potentially get in trouble for that. So encryption may be something that you're thinking about and something where how can we keep everybody safe? We found Signal to be great until Iran recently blocked Signal. We are now back to WhatsApp. Uh, encrypted emails, sending. I don't know if any of you use certain you know, exterior uh, encryption services. But what's nice about sending is it's end-to-end -end encrypted. It can only be opened by the person who receives it after they click, yes, please, and open this encrypted email. And there's all kinds of great things to track it. Um, and you can also set self-destruction on it. And so uh, you can have it be so this email self-destructs after being opened within seven days. So there's no chance if email ever is hacked to come back in and see it again. So finally, wrapping this up, I would encourage you to know where your consumer is, is number one. Because if you're not going to be able to advertise, if you're going to be within one of these restricted industries where, where Facebook isn't just, it's just waiting for your dollars, then you really need to know where your people are. Because it's very likely that they may not just be on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. They may be on some forum or on some app or they may be on some third-party network that, that is, that, that's talking to the community they want. You must know that, that the more you interact with these people, the more you can gain your organic reach. You can influence that Facebook edge rank. You know, all these social networks are changing their, their edge ranking and the way that things are displaying to people. So the more you think people used to interacting with you, we have found that, again, most effective to use influencers and find ways to either collaborate with other people in the industry or find people who can do the talking for you. Your Facebook ads that are within, and your Instagram ads that are within restricted industries, the less graphic they are, the more likely they are to be approved. 
I have a, a Facebook ad consultant that works with me once a week. And we were talking just yesterday, and she found it funny because, well, she had a client who had submitted an ad for an industry that has a lot of restrictions on it. Facebook rejected it. They took the ad back. They removed two words from the text, and they added a little bit of blur to the photo, resubmitted the ad, and it was approved. And so get creative with it. You know, we, we've seen other clients within the, the firearms industry try things with the artwork um, or copy specifically, where you're alluding to what's happening but not being so graphic about it. Um, just have to be creative and continue trying. Don't make claims, look for collaborative opportunities, videos, live streaming, live video, as much as possible. Everybody's moving to video. I mean, isn't it amazing when you open up your phone now, and instead of Facebook being like 17 little messages, it's one gigantic photo or one gigantic video. That should be enough to tell us that video is where everything is continuing to head, and everything already is. Like, it's, it's not headed there, it already is. And when I'm trying to figure out how to edit video, I call my 13-year-old niece, because she can walk it walk me through it quicker than I can watch five YouTube videos on it. And if you're looking for a good uh, video editing app for your phone, if you take a lot of video on your phone, check out Cut Pro. It's one of my favorite super easy to use video editing apps where you can uh, overlay photos, you can add text, you can add all kinds of nice things that might make it go viral. But finally, have fun, be human, and always be willing to adapt. Because especially within a restricted industry, the only thing that's promised is that changes are going to continue to come. Restrictions are going to continue to happen. It's just going to be up to us and how we react to them. So happy to take any questions if you have any. And if not, thank you for coming. very strict Christian household. I am a Christian, Bible-believing Christian, um, which people a lot of times find shocking because I'm pro-cannabis. Um, but my dad's attitude, my dad is extremely uh, straight-laced, engineer background. Um, as things have evolved, specifically within the cannabis industry, uh, he's become more and more open to it. My mother has early onset Alzheimer. We've been amazed by some of the effects that some of the solves can have on our muscle pain. Uh, we've been really encouraged by some of the new research coming out uh, about the effects of THC on the plaque on Alzheimer patients' brains. And so I think he's beginning, like much of the people his age, his attitude is beginning to change. It wasn't long ago, he was in his house, his, my house, his hands were hurting. I said, Dad, why don't you try something to solve? We put some of the it's THC cream on his hands, and about an hour later, he noticed he could move his hand better. And suddenly, he wasn't thinking that I'm sitting at home taking bong rips and eating Doritos. And so, uh, which I may be doing, but I wasn't in that kind of um, But he was suddenly a little bit more at ease. And so, but it's a, it's a great question, especially knowing my background. Um, I've seen just a continuous evolution uh, from from his generation on that topic. Uh, yes? Um, even though a lot of these industries are evolving and, and what you're promoting may be currently legal in the location, what is an agency's or a representative's obligation to report illegal activity of something that's posted into their site or a group or something like that? I don't know what their legal obligation is. Um, I've always left it up to the client where I'll say, hey, this just you know this was just posted on your wall. Um, if you have a fairly popular, you know, specifically within the legal cannabis industry, um, if you have a large page, um, it's not uncommon for like delivery guys or whatever to post their specials on your wall, hoping that your followers will see it. Um, and we delete, we just delete them immediately. Um, and sometimes we'll even try to message them and say, hey man, didn't know if you know, but you're not allowed to do this. And on top of that, you're putting yourself at risk. You're giving the industry a bad name. Yeah, you get us all in trouble. Uh, and so lots of times, people, specifically in, the, in that industry, uh, they're kind of cool about it, because if you hit them up with a message that's just being very, very honest, and say, look, man, we're all trying to grow this industry together, we're all trying to bring legitimacy to this, and you doing that isn't helping. Um, but I don't know what the legal implications are. I do know as far as um, pricing, it gets really interesting. So like, if you guys go check out Canubo's Facebook page, Canuvo is a dispensary down in Saco. Um, Canuvo, you'll notice there's no photos. And, and it's interesting, I'm, I'm assuming one of the reasons they're doing that, and it's a stance that some cannabis companies have been taking, is the less photos you're sharing of actual product, the less likely you are to get red flagged and have Facebook crack down on you. Um, it's the same reasons why companies who grow massive followings on Instagram or Facebook oftentimes have backup pages. 
And so what they'll say is like, hey, like us here. And then shortly thereafter, you'll start seeing like little messages by, hey, like our backup page. And that's because it's not uncommon, specifically within the cannabis and firearms world, to grow a huge following, getting a lot of interaction, and then one day you wake up and your page is gone. And so it's helped, it happened uh, to the Willie, Willie Nelson came up with his own strain not too long ago. It helped, happened to them. It's happened to Leafly. It's happened to a couple of major players in the industry. They grew massive followings. Uh, Angry Buds is another one. And then all of a sudden wake up and the following is gone. So, so it's, it's, it's interesting as the industry continues to change to see how they handle it. The other change that's happened recently is if you go on Canuvo's page, specifically on their Facebook page, they just recently added a place where they actually list pricing. So in the past, you weren't allowed to include pricing with product. And uh, Leafly came out with an app for your Facebook page where you can list uh, strain and pricing. So you can go on there and see an ounce or an eighth or you know, whatever it is that people are buying, and you can actually see pricing. In the past, that was illegal. I don't even know if it is legal still or isn't illegal, but all of a sudden it appeared on the page the other day. Um, so things are evolving very, very quickly. <laughs> we have time for maybe one more question. Okay. How much time do you spend on your phone? <laughs> a lot. Just ask Rick. Um, a, a lot of time on my phone. Uh, a, a lot of my management is done on my phone. Thank you, dogs. I travel a lot. Uh, we have five people who work for me now also, so that, that helps out every time. That's a good question. <laughs> I never don't have an exterior phone battery. Let's just say that. So. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you guys for coming. Thank you. Thank you.